Let us pray. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, a pilgrim in the barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Guide me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me until I want no more. Lord God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Let it be a seed that is planted in good soil and produces a great harvest. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. For the time that is ours to share together, I want to talk a little bit about I guess I'll say it again. I guess I'll say it again. We've been walking through Philippians during this season, and uh, with the, what you heard in your hearing, verse, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, is the, 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 the context for the message. I guess I'll say it again. Uh, when John F. Kennedy was inaugurated president in 1961, he challenged the Americans saying, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Amen. Amen. Less than about two months later, he established a way for Americans to do just that. He signed an executive order setting up what was called the Peace Corps. It was John F. Kennedy's idea to get those thousands of people who were not professional diplomats uh, nor career adventurers, um, just ordinary people, perhaps with a particular skill set, be it agriculture or engineering or teaching, to fan out throughout the world and help people. The core, as it's called, continues to give people opportunities to serve the country and the cause of peace by living and working in developing countries. And in over 50 plus years since its founding, more than 200,000 Americans have joined the Peace Corps, serving in 139 countries. And, and they're making a difference every day with innovation and creativity, determination, and, and compassion. They, they do AIDS education. Uh, they do emerging technologies. They do environmental preservation uh, to new market economies. They, the Peace Corps website says that Peace Corps volunteers have helped people build better lives from the, for themselves. They, they work in villages and towns and countries and, and making a difference every day. Uh, they represent a legacy of service, it says, that is a significant part of America's history and positive image abroad. The people love to serve in the Peace Corps. Uh, they are able to do that because when they get into the Peace Corps, they are tapping into something that is greater than themselves. They're able to do that because they're tapping into a power that is more important than themselves. It's a power not their own, and they realize something bigger than themselves is at work. And when they reach into this power, that is greater than themselves, they're able to do great things. They do great things for the Peace Corps. Yeah. Now I stop by to tell you that we also, as believers in the body of Christ, are a part of something bigger than ourselves. We also, as believers in the body of Christ, are able to tap up into some power that is not our own and to help us do greater things than we would be able to do for ourselves. We are able to tap into some Holy Ghost power, and that Holy Ghost power is enough to keep us stepping one foot after another when other people may have given up a long time ago. That Holy Ghost power is able to put a smile on our face when it don't look like there's anything else to be smiling about. That Holy Ghost power is able to be uh, something that we hold on to in the middle of the night so that we know that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We are able to tap 
into a power that is greater than ourselves. And because we are able to tap into a power that is greater than ourselves, we have something to rejoice about. Ah, yes, we have some unifying power. Let the church say unifying power. Unifying power. Ah, Paul is asking these believers, he says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, for my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord this way, dear friends. He's telling them to stand firm in unity. Last week, we talked about unity, unity, unity. That is a theme that goes throughout the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians is unity and in this unifying power we have some contenders we have two women in the church that have apparently been arguing with one another and they are obviously leaders in the church because Paul took the time to mention them by name with all that was going on with Paul personally and professionally, in and out of jail, getting beat to share the gospel, uh, arguing with Peter about whether or not new converts or people that were born in should have access to Jesus. Everything that's going on, he took the time to acknowledge these women by name. And we all know how I feel about women in ministry. If you don't know, let me tell you for a little bit. First of all, we got a woman associate pastor on staff. I just, I just came after a woman senior pastor. When we look at the gospel, what is the gospel? That God was, that the son of God was born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the father. Who was there to know he was born of a virgin? A woman. Who was there when he was crucified? dead and buried a woman the men left who was there to know that he rose again on the third day the women the angel told them to go tell the disciples so I have absolutely no problem just FYI this wasn't a part of the sermon I have no problem with women in ministry Paul took the time to acknowledge these women by name he got all kind of church stuff going on in all kind of churches he's talking about because he wrote a letter to Ephesians and he wrote a letter to Colossians and all these other churches going on. So obviously these women were of some importance for him to have to mention them by name because it's clear in the Bible when you read any letter about Paul or any letter from Paul rather, if he don't mention you by name, you might be an enemy. But Paul commends these two as co-workers beloved by God whose name is in the Lamb's book of life. And there's something to be taken from that. Uh, when it talks about that, when you read all the writings of Paul, he doesn't acknowledge his enemies by name. Ah, right. uh, We could learn from that. This could be a lesson in leadership. We ought not acknowledge our enemies by name. I say we ought not acknowledge our enemies by name. We ought not give them credence. We ought not give them time in our head. They ought not be able to live in our lives without paying rent. We got to move on past those things and focus on the things that are good. And so we have these contenders who are at odds with each other, who have been arguing in the church, and he's telling them to stand firm. And we, have from the, uh, we get from the contender to a counselor. He reaches out to somebody and he said that, that I ask that my true companion help these women since they have contended my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Paul calls on somebody else to help them with the reconciliation because we are in this thing together. I say time and time again, you cannot be a Christian outside of community. Just going to the church does not make you a Christian. If just going to the church made you a Christian, just standing in the garage would make you a car. Just standing at a hospital bed would make you a doctor. Just standing in front of a classroom would make you a teacher. There are things you have to do. There needs to be some actions with what you've done. You can't just say it and be all right. Uh, so Paul urges them to have the same mind. He doesn't take a side on it. He just urges them to be of the same mind. And he urges them to be of the same mind because when the leaders of the church are spending too much time arguing, there is no work to get done. If the leaders of the church 
are spending too much time arguing over who gets to be over what and whose name gets printed bigger in the program and who wants this versus that. There is no work to be done. So Paul urges them in Philippians and the church as a whole to be of the same mind of Christ. Why? Because we are not doing this for ourselves. We are not doing any of this to pad our resumes. We are not doing this so we can have our name engraved on a plaque. We are not doing this so everybody can say, look at me and look at all of the great works I've done. We are doing this to edify the kingdom. We need to be of the same mind, and not only do we need to be of the same mind, we need to be of the same mind in the Lord. Amen. Uh, and so we go from this unifying power to some fortifying power. Let the church say fortifying power. Fortifying. Not only do we have to be of the same mind of the Lord, we also need to rejoice in the Lord. Not only do we need to be of the same mind in the Lord, we need to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice, have joy. Happiness is different than joy. Happiness can come and go based on whether or not your friend spoke to you today. Happiness can come or go whether or not your spouse is acting right. Happiness can come or go based on whether or not they acting like they got some sense at the job or not. Happiness depends on other people, but joy is different. Joy is not dependent upon these circumstances. Joy is dependent upon the Lord. Our joy should be in what God has done for us and what God continues to do for us. Our joy should come from the Lord, and not only should our joy come from the Lord, we ought to be able to share it with others. Yeah. Bishop T. Garrett Benjamin said time and time again, if there is joy in your heart, you ought not keep that a secret from your face. There is joy. This joy happens to us and we ought to be able to share it with others. We ought to have joy because he woke us up this morning. We ought to have joy because he started us on our way. We ought to have joy because we got food on the table. We ought to have joy because we are in our right minds with clothes on our back. We have joy because of what God's done for us. We have joy because he sent his son to die for our sins. We have joy because we have access to heaven and not death, hell, and the grave. We should have joy for all of these things. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. So we should rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoicing is the proper response to what God has done. It's the proper response to having fellowship in the body of Christ. Rejoicing is the proper response we should have because the Lord is near. Uh, one translation says, when Jesus says that the kingdom of God is at hand, not only does that mean it's coming, but it means that we can reach out and grab it. We ought to be looking at more practical ways to show ourselves the love of Christ. We ought to be using our practical ways to show people that we are a Christian. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. You all, even though I'm doing this for a living, will preach way more sermons than I ever will. When somebody is thinking about what a Christian is, they're looking, about, they're looking at you, how you talk to them, how you treat them, how you act when you think nobody else is looking. You are somebody's interpretation of a Christian. You are somebody's definition of a Christian. And so we ought to be able to rejoice in the Lord always, knowing what God has done for us, because God is near. Paul says over and over again in Philippians to rejoice. It's a prominent theme and the command to rejoice can always be obeyed. You can rejoice whether you're broke or you got all your money in your pocket. You can rejoice whether you got friends or not a friend at all. You can rejoice if ain't nobody else here to rejoice with you. You rejoice is an, an order to a command that can always be obeyed. Uh, he says in Philippians 1 and 18, what then? Only that in every way and whether presence or truth, Christ is priest, I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. He slides on down to chapter 2 and says that holding fast to the word of life so I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. 2.17 says, yes, if I am being poured out as a drink offering, as a sacrifice of the service of your faith, I am glad and will rejoice in you all. And then he says, for the same reason, you 
you need to be rejo you need to rejoice and be glad with me therefore I sent them more eagerly when you see them you may rejoice and you may bless sorrowful goes on finally to say that for uh, all for Christ finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you that is yours but yours is safe and then in Philippians 3 and 3 he says for the circumcision those who worship God in the spirit rejoice in Christ Jesus we have the confidence in the flesh he says it all over and over again rejoice 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 even though he is writing from prison he can rejoice even though his leaders in the church are fighting with each other he can rejoice even though he took beatings trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world he still rejoiced so if he can rejoice after being beaten and put in prison and churches falling apart I can lift up holy hands and worship the Lord for whatever I'm going through because I have a reason to rejoice the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever and then he tells them in the and, and, and we move from power to having prayer and there's two words when he says it, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present our requests to God. We can't just pray one time and be good. It says in everything, in everything. with prayer and supplication. Yes. There's no thing that I can think of that you do just once and it's all good. <laughs> I can't go to the gym one time and be good for the rest of the year. I can't eat one salad and my blood pressure and cholesterol be right for the rest of the year. I can't do it. I can't just read the Bible one time and be good for the rest of the year on these sermons. I can't just pray one time and be good for the rest of the year. I can't just fast one time and be good for the rest of the year. I can't just go to church one time and be good for the rest of the year. These things we have to do over and over again. That's the only way we can get good at it because if we don't get good at it, we'll, we'll, be able to, we'll end up suffering to temptation and following off, falling off. We have to keep fasting, we have to keep praying, and we have to keep letting our requests be made known to God. Why? Because it's not just about making our requests be made known to God. It's also about us. We have to, we have to improve our discipline. We have to get better and better. Because sometimes the prayer doesn't change the thing the way you want it to change. Sometimes the prayer is about changing you until the situation changes. So keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, and when you're done praying, pray some more. Ah, yes. And when we get that, we'll have that peace that passes all understanding. When everybody else will be losing their head and going crazy, we'll be able to keep ourselves together. When everybody else is mad and upset about what's going on, we'll understand that my God shall supply all my needs according to the riches and glory, glory about Christ Jesus. We'll be able to understand that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We'll be, understand, be able to understand that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver us through them all. And we'll go through the fire and come out as pure gold. Much prayer, much supplication. And we'll move and we'll go from that prayer and supplication to peace. We'll be able to walk into the situation and keep our heads. And people will wonder why. Why you got that smile on your face? Why are you not cussing that person out? Why are you holding your own in these situations even though it's bad all the way around? You'll have that peace that passes all understanding. And so we have that unifying power. And then we have that fortifying power, that power that gives us strength. And then we go from that to some purifying power. Let the church say purifying power. Purifying power. We ought to fix our thoughts on things that are good and true and right. A mind is a powerful thing. Yes, and when you control the mind, you can control other things. I, I, I'm always interested when I see uh, animals, particularly horses or elephants, when they're grown because these people will tie them up, they'll hitch them up to a chair or a post or something that is, un, that is very easy for them to break. But the reason they're able to do that is because their mind has been controlled since they were little. 
they kept putting chains on them and things that were too hard to break. So they got to the point that when the chains was around their neck, they felt, well, I can't break it, so I'm going to just stay here. And then as they grew older, you could chain them, you could tie them up, you didn't even need a chain no more. You could just put a small little rope on it and tie it to something that if they really understood the power that was within them, they'd be able to break it. And so I came by to tell you to put your mind on the things that are good. You put your mind on the things that are good because you are blessed in the city, blessed in the field. You are blessed in your going and in your coming. You are the lender and not the borrower. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and shall never be beneath. You just have to know it. You are the righteousness of God. You are the apple of God's eye. God loves you. God knows how many hairs are on your head and he speaks and universes are formed. God loves you. You just have to understand who it is that loves you and know what's going on. And think about those things. What we say to people, what we say to our children, what we say to our parents, what we say to our relatives, all of those things have power. And we hold on to those things. We ought to be able to think about things that are good. We ought to be able to focus on things that are good. I, I'm... I, I had a, a, a guilty pleasure I used to enjoy, particularly when I started learning how to play instruments. I was taking piano lessons and I was taking drum lessons and, and then working as an engineer uh, for, for musicians, I would spend a lot of time around music. And one thing that I enjoyed was listening to bad music. There were all kind of funny videos going around of people that would be singing and they'd crack, they wouldn't hit the right note, or they would play bad and, you know, a drummer that couldn't stay in the pocket, or, or a piano player or an organ that was just all over the place and not just playing the music. That was funny to me. And then one day, I was watching one of these videos somebody had shared on Facebook and another musician I knew put a comment at the bottom. I didn't share the picture, I just saw it, and so I was watching and laughing, and I saw the comments come in, and one of the musicians said, y'all keep listening to this bad music if you want to. One day it's going to show up in your plan. Mm -mm. See, uh, uh, many, many a musician, whether they can read music or not, usually plays by ear. Uh, even, even, even the most top-notch professional musicians I've been around know how to read, but when it's time to play, they play by ear. I went to see a concert on Wednesday night, and, and uh, that, it was one band for every artist, one band for Jay, this same band played for Kathy Taylor, J.J. Harrison, Kirk Carr, Donald Lawrence, and a whole, uh, uh, um, somebody, it was a bunch of, uh, Tiff Joy, who wrote some uh, songs for Ricky Dillard, uh, all these, these big time artists, same band. Well, here's how they rehearsed. The musician, the, the artist sent them a copy of the music and they listened to it and played till they got it. So they allowed the music into their head. Yeah. So long story short, what they listened to is what came out of them when it was time to perform. And so you spend this time listening to bad things and putting these bad things uh -huh. in you, they will eventually come out so lo and behold, I kind of stopped listening to that kind of stuff because I don't want the bad stuff to come out of me. Not just with music, but in life. Who the people I listen to that are negative and always got something bad to say about me. People who ain't got nothing else to talk about but gossip about other people. I can't let those things into me because if I let those things into me, they're going to come out of me one time and it's going to come out of me at the wrong time. Think on the things that are good and pure. Yeah, amen. And, and, and what you think about will come out. I think about Nick Saban. Nick Saban, who is uh, the, the, the most dominant college football coach in, in this industry right now. National championship after national championship. Even if you want to win a national championship, you see, it seems like you got to beat him to win it. Because if he ain't winning it, he's still in a championship game. But whenever you listen to him in an interview, time and time again, they ask him about other stuff. I don't think about that. I don't spend no time talking about that. I'm thinking about the next game. I'm thinking about how I got these hundreds of players that are out here working hard for me. So he spends this time over and over again. He's focused on his, what he needs to do in order to accomplish a goal. He thinks on the things, and what he thinks on is what comes out in the results. Uh, he may not understand, and I watched in one interview where he confused Snapchat and Facebook and called it Snapface. 
but he got millions of dollars a year as a coach because he's winning over and over again. So I think it's okay if I, I think I'd rather have the paycheck than be able to distinguish between Facebook and Snapchat. That's just me. What he thinks about is what's going on. I look at another football coach that cheats, I mean, uh, wins a lot, Bill Belichick, time and time again. I watched when he won the Super Bowl last year, and the first thing they said when they put a microphone in his face about how great is it to win the Super Bowl, Coach Belichick, Coach Belichick said this was nice, but the fact of the matter is, is I'm actually five weeks behind on the, pre on the next coming season because everybody else has had time to to prepare what you think about is where you focus at and what 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 you put in you is what's going to come out so why don't we put some stuff in us that can produce a result why don't we put some stuff in us that can give us something better for us why don't we put some stuff in us that allow us to be better as a person and a christian and a believer of christ focus on the good are we thinking about how much attention we should be getting for stuff? Or are we thinking about what we should really be doing? Yes. Ah, yes, that purifying power. And we have that, and that is a reason to rejoice. And Paul says, if you can't find anybody else, look at him as an example. Whatever you have learned or received or heard or seen from me, in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So listen to what the man of God had to tell the church at Philippi the, in the letter of the, of the letter Philippians. He told them to put their mind on these things. He told them. Excuse me. He told them over and over again to rejoice because we all have something to rejoice about whether we know it or not. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. I got something to rejoice about. I woke up this morning. I got something to rejoice about. Again, I say rejoice. I made it here safely. Again, I say rejoice. We all made it here safely. Again, I say rejoice. We could have been dead. Sleeping in our grave. Again, I say rejoice. We are in our right minds. Again, I say rejoice. In the beginning was the word. Again, I say rejoice. And the word was with God. Again, I say rejoice. And the word was God. Again, I say rejoice. And the word became flesh. Again, I say rejoice. This word became a human being and put on human flesh. Again, I say rejoice. It came down through 42 generations. Again, I say rejoice. Live the life that we could not live. Again, I say rejoice. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Opened up blinded eyes. Set the captives free. Declared the acceptable year of the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. And live the life that none of us could live. Again, I say rejoice. And they took him and whipped him with a cat of nine tails. Again, I say rejoice. They had him carry a cross all the way up Calvary. Again, I say rejoice. They put a crown of thorns on his head. Again, I say rejoice. They pierced him in his side. Again, I say rejoice. While all of that was going on, he said, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Again, I say rejoice. They put a sign above his head and said, here lies Jesus, King of the Jews. Again, I say rejoice. And then he died. Again, I say rejoice. But I'm so glad that's not where the story ends. Early on the third day, he rose up with all power in his hands. Again, I say rejoice. And because he did that, we all don't have to worry about the penalty of sin. Again, I say rejoice. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come.